right, everyone, thank you for coming to our talk. There's a lot of great talks competing with us right now, and uh, lunch, of course, uh, first line in the queue. You're missing out on that for uh, this talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm your friend Emanuele, and this is Murhaf, and for the next half hour or so, we're going to talk about insurance. <laughs> 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 That's what I want to hear. Uh, but first, but first, a little bit, a uh, little bit about us. So we've been working together for the last 13 years or so. First in academia, we took our masters and our PhD together. Then we done some research on interesting things like uh, machine learning approaches for syntactic and semantic analysis. Used to be a thing. It's still a thing. Uh, and then we moved over to the exciting world of NLP uh, startups, where we worked uh, in a pre-LLM uh, chatbot company, which is now a, a relatively successful uh, post-LLM uh, chatbot company. And then we took the next logical, obvious step, which was get a gig in insurance. Does everybody here have insurance? That's great. That's good. Uh, so insurance is this thing where you uh, basically bet money that something is going to go wrong. And if that bad thing happens, then you win. <laughs> Which makes it, of course, a great place to, <laughs> to, uh, be, uh, to work with machine learning. Am I right? Yes. So what you see back here on the slides is one of our recruitment videos. And it goes something like this. Insurance is not just about compensating damages, it's also about predicting what can go wrong and, and how it can go wrong. And in that prediction, you have basically risk modeling, which is you know, typical pricing, fraud detection, et cetera, et cetera. These are the more classical applications of uh, machine learning in, in insurance. But where we found our, our NLP niche is in customer communication insights and in uh, in autom uh, automation. So in customer communication insights, is, it's more like, what can we do so our customers like us more? And automation is about how can we process claims as quickly as possible so our customers like us more or like us at all. So coming up in this talk, we're going to tell you some battle stories from NLP on how and why we built this Frankenstein app or Streamlit app. And uh, how we managed to automate about 14% of uh, the claims we are getting in from uh, our portal using something that looks a lot like search. Uh, Spoiling it. But first, about happy customers. All right. Um, yeah, so this is the people whose natural language we process, right? Um, there are three main drivers for uh, customer satisfaction in insurance. You get money, of course. You are going to be unhappy if we're not going to uh, settle your claim, right? This is really boring if you work with customer satisfaction, right? Because there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you either have coverage or you don't. Uh, so boring. Speed is not a factor. So how quickly you uh, either get your claim set settled or rejected. This is also a bit boring uh, for people working with customer satisfaction because we kind of know what we have to do in order to uh, make this better. Right? But it's mostly an uh, economic assessment, really. We can hire more people so that we can process claims faster. Or we can automate more, which is hard. More on that later. The third main driver is customer experience. So how clear were the insurance term? Did I feel like I was talking to a robot that didn't really understand the uh, tragic circumstances uh, I was going through when I submitted my claim. Did I feel like the, um, like the um, questioning uh, form uh, was an interrogation from the FBI, right? Was the um, uh, appraiser a jerk to me? All of this, we can do something about it, right? We can be clearer, we can be nicer, we can make sure that our um, that our employees have a sneakers, um, a sneakers before uh, talking to uh, our customers. So what do we do? Not us, the company. We set a goal, like an uh, objective, in a in OKR world. It roughly translates to the customer must always be met with precise and welcoming language. And how do we know? 
if we are meeting our goal. Where we can ask the customers, we can see what they tell us and if they talk about this uh, dimensions of interest. Is, of interest. Precision, uh, clarity, and being nice. But the feedback that we get are not all interesting to, uh, uh, to know something about this, right? to quantify this. Some feedbacks are just generally positive, that's great, but not interesting. Some, a lot of feedbacks are negative, but not necessarily interesting, right? Because they're about money or speed. And then again, some feedbacks are going to be positive and yet interesting because they give us tips on things that weren't ideal during, the, uh, ideal during the process. Or they just tell us straight up that the case manager didn't believe me. Right? Those are interesting. And if you've been in this game for any amount of time, of course, you know what to do, right? You build a classifier, right, for these dimensions, uh, dimensions of interest. You say that, all right, you get, you, we define a class uh, and call it impudence, so that's people that's not nice, and not a class, we call it clarity or unclarity, because that's what we are out for. And then we count the messages uh, above a certain score, and then build a KPI around it, right? count a message for a given month, and then we have to be above or below a certain threshold to uh, have achieved our goal for that, for that month. The problem is that while we did have uh, a lot of good data for vanilla sentiment analysis, right, positivity or negativity, we had no gold data for the specific dimensions of interest which would allow us to uh, score and calculate this KPI. So what did we do? What did we do? Yeah, but uh, before what did we do? What would you do today if you had this problem? How do you get more data if you don't have any training data? That's an actual question. That's an easy question. Yes, exactly. LLMs. So uh, we could have used LLMs, but we are interested in real customer data. So the next best thing is to use an LLM to annotate your, your data, right? That's, that's good, but then our data is in Norwegian, so first we have to find that good model in Norwegian, because all the good models that we see nowadays are good in English, and then as soon as you start moving to other languages, the, the, the quality would, would, would vary, to put it mildly, right? Uh, and then you have to go into you know, the rabbit hole of prompting and in-context learning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but say Expensive. That you did all of that, Say you did all of that, then you have to make sure that you did it in a compliant way, right? So we can't just send our data to any third party. We have to do it. Most likely, you will end up having to do it in-house, which means we have to deal with licensing, etc., etc., etc. But there is a way. Anyone has heard of weak supervision before? Except you, Marcus. No. Okay. Shut up, Marcus. So. <clears throat> Weak supervision is this programmatic way of labeling your data. So instead of going through your data set and annotating the, the data by hand, you write labeling functions. Those labeling functions together are going to approximate the labels that you are after. So let's get concrete a little bit. So we have our customer communication data set. We are, our X is the, the messages that the customers leave us. And our Y, let's say, <coughs> how uh, unclear we were, or if we were perceived as unclear or not in our communication. So one such labeling function can go over things that are observable in your data. For example, the top one here, we're looking at the length of the message, how many words are there in this message. And we have our model for sentiment. So we can use that, the output from that for the sentiment model, to threshold. If it's lower than five words, shorter than five words, and the se sentiment score is lower than a certain threshold, most likely this is a positive message. We're going to label this in zero. Otherwise, we'll make this labeling function abstain. Don't vote. And so on and so forth. We can, uh, this is not very visible, but the idea in, that in the third uh, labeling function, for example, is that we, we can also encode the domain knowledge we have. So instead of going to our colleagues and ask them to annotate data, we can ask them about what are the most indicative words of us being unclear? And then they can give us a list, and then we look, we look, we look up uh, words in that list, we see if, if a message contains one of those words. So together, you can write, we, we wrote tens of those labeling functions. You can aggregate the, uh, the output of, this, uh, of these uh, labeling functions in a very simple way, which is you know, 
majority vote, or you can even train a model that gives you a probabilistic value of how likely a message is, is, is in, in that class or not. But anyway, what you get out of this is what we refer to as a silver data set. It's a data set that is automatically annotated, which we then used to train our models, models uh, that go over uh, us being perceived unclear, impudent, etc., etc. What did you do with these models? Right, so we uh, uh, build these um, BERT models on top of the uh, silver annotations and actually end up with some very good classifiers. Uh, we, we're getting great F scores and uh, we can use them to uh, do our KPIs. But what we're doing there, it's basically putting those messages into buckets, right? The not nice bucket and the unclear bucket. So we hand it over to our stakeholders and they say, great, this is fantastic. Now we know whether or not we, are, um, we have achi achieved our goal. But in order for us to achieve our goal, well, we're actually going to have to read those messages, right? So what are they telling us? How can we do better? What are the pain points? And so we say, well, that's not a problem. We can just give you the softmax uh, probabilities from, uh, from the classifier and then sort them according, uh, according to that, right? That's going to work. Turns out that when we did that, the messages that came uh, out on top across all of the different subsets of the data, you know, the different departments and different time periods, uh, didn't really spark joy. We were getting a lot of uh, unexpected randomness. We weren't, we weren't getting that... Um, um, that peak of relevance for the top messages and then a gentle drop off in relevance uh, with regards to these dimensions of interest. Yes. Turns out that our model wasn't well calibrated. So we had to learn what's a well calibrated model. What's a well calibrated model? Yeah, so a well calibrated model is a model whose accuracy is almost equal to its confidence. So say you have your classifier. Uh, you do whatever you want, and then you have on top of the classifier, your last layer is your softmax, which gives you out a, a probability score. So if you do 100 independent predictions with that model, for each of those 100 predictions, your model is outputting 0 0.8. If your model is well calibrated, it's going to be 80% correct. So 80% correct of those predictions. And as it turns out, if you train a neural network with a cross-entropy loss, the negative log likelihood, there is a chance that your model comes out poorly calibrated. What does that mean? It means that your model is overconfident of its predictions, so it's outputting scores that are either very close to one or very close to zero. So that's, that's the, the, the graph you see on, 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 uh, on the top there. And that's not something we just observed, it's something that was observed in the literature. Uh, and they refer to it as, as peaky distributions. Peaky. So the, the, the longer you, you train your, your, uh, your neural network, the, the, the lower the entropy of the, the prediction or, or the softmax probabilities is. There is a small fix that we did for this, which is to use the focal cross entropy, which is, you can think of it as an adjustment of the cross entropy loss, where for each, so instead of assigning similar weight to all samples for each batch you're, you're, you're computing your, your loss, you can actually give higher significance or higher weight to samples that are hard to learn. What does that mean? Hard to learn is, is basically samples that the model is getting wrong, right? You're training, you know which, which samples your model is predicting correctly, which ones it's not predicting correctly. Based on that, you can assign uh, weights, and that gives you this nicer distribution, at least for our use case, where the model is actually more, more well calibrated. And this is actually also very useful when you work with imbalanced data. And that's the case also for our, for our uh, data set. So now we have actually a model that's well calibrated that can help us rank the messages in the way that the most typical message of us being unclear will actually have the highest score. And the more you move towards the zero, the less typical or completely irrelevant the messages are which led us to the stream lead monstrosity. Um, this great app, I mean. So what we did, what we could do then, is basically build the Netflix of unhappy customers for our colleagues. Um, so now they could 
find a, uh, um, an interesting time period for their department and sort the messages according to their specific dimension of interest. There's a bunch, you know, like in clarity and impudence we talked about. And then of course, we also threw uh, lexical and semantic search on top so that, you, so that the system has this nice property where you can search for a concept or for a word and then get the results re-ranked according to the phenomenon, the phenomena that you want to investigate as a uh, claim settlement guy or gal. Um, and then, of course, they come back to us and say, you know what, I am reading too many messages. What we really want is we want a breakdown of the content of the messages for a given search and dimension. And we were like, aren't we savvy <laughs> in, in claim settlements? But of course, we built it, right? Yeah. So that was uh, so basically, you're not interested in reading the messages. You want to know the content of the messages. So you want to know the drivers behind those. So that's a topic modeling case for us. So we want to cluster those messages in certain topics. And then that's what we're going to present to our uh, users, colleagues. So uh, we're not going to go into the details of how we did topic modeling, but we used a library called Bird Topic. Very nice library. If you haven't used it before, check it out. It gives you this ability to create a pipeline for topic modeling. It's a very, very modular library, so you can choose your embeddings, and then afterwards you can choose a different uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm as you wish, et cetera, et cetera. And you put these blocks together, and you have your topic modeling. So your input is the messages. Your output is a set of clusters, set of topics. Each is represented by the, uh, a set of keywords that are most representative of this, of this uh, topic. Right? So things like the examples here, which we, are, we actually have copied from BERT topic. So these are from, from the documentation. So again, you're giving those, you know, those keywords to your non-technical colleagues. So they're going to have to make sense of this. And it's not as easy as you would think, so they would want something that is more readable, a phrase uh, that is condensed with information and contains, really describes what this, what's the, what this topic is about. So as Bert Topic suggests, there you can use an LLM, actually. You can use an LLM to uh, represent the, the, uh, the label of each topic. So that's exactly what we did. Shout out to Marcus. Who actually, Shout out, Marcus. Actually did this work. And, uh, we use it a bit outside bird topic in our own way, but the sort of the idea here for us is that we couldn't have solved this problem without an LLM. In contrast to what we did with weak supervision, the weak supervision we felt like we could actually solve it without using an LLM. In this case, we actually there was no way we can generate this these good-looking uh, labels at least uh, without without having an LLM in our in our uh, in our stack. I just want to uh, recommend everybody to uh, look for Marcus after the talk if you're interested in prompt engineering, because he's got some tips. <laughs> okay. And you should ask him exactly how he increased the performance of this particular prompt. It's an interesting one. On to automation. So, uh, how does automation work? So, say you're one of our customers, you go into our website, you have home insurance. Uh, insurance of the contents of your, of your home, and you want to claim insurance. So you have to fill out a form, obviously. Well, while you're filling out that form, then you have to specify what type of object you are claiming insurance for. And then there is a subtype of that type, and there is a sub sub subtype of that subtype. I, I'm not sure if I said that correctly. Anyway, along the way, you might say, OK, I didn't find the, the type or the subtype or the sub subtype then I'm going to choose other, or you're just lazy and you choose other from the beginning. And when you do that, then you're prompted to write a description of the object you're claiming insurance for, but more importantly, you actually stopped automation. Because for us, to automate afterwards, we need to exactly know which object you are claiming insurance for, because we have different rules and different processes, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the 14% we were referring to. So 14% of the claims, they don't, uh, they don't pick the right category for any reason, and we need to do something with that. So we need to take that text that the customer wrote and put it back in its right place in our object tree, if you like. So which looks something like this. So 
we have uh, you know electronic appliances under that you have computer and accessories and under that you have mouse laptop etc so it's a, it's a, it's a it's a tree so for us this looked like a simple classification problem we just flatten out this tree we put together all these you know you, we go down all the paths and just put together all the categories, subcategories, and sub-subcategories, and creating these class names. And then we just take this text and try to classify it into one of those uh, categories. Isn't that the point? That is perfectly right and great, because we got data so we can just build it, no problem. Problem. It turns out that at any given mo moment, so on uh, any uh, normal Tuesday, uh, Kim from uh, Claims Automation can decide that they don't like the sound of that subcategory, so maybe that's what's confusing the users, right? So let's call it something else so that it's easier for our customers to find the correct category. Or a new object might be invented, right? So we need a new leaf. Or maybe we built the tree wrong, right? So maybe we should just move um, a whole subtree uh, under a different parent, right? This is something that can happen at any given moment in automation, in claims automation, and that's just how they've done. They've always done things, right? So of course, what can we do? Well, we can change the way we do things. Uh, how many of you uh, here work for an organization with more than uh, 500 employees? Yeah, right, you don't change things willy-nilly in another department. That's not going to happen. That's going to take the wind out of the project. Um, that's, that's a project in itself, right? So how did we solve this? I mean, approach this. That's more modest. We solved it. Uh, we, um, we basically treated it like a search problem. Or, as we found out in the literature, um, a zero-shot classification, which is much cooler. So what we do is that we take the uh, description from the, from the uh, customer and we embed it, and then we just take, in the same call, I'm not joking, the whole, uh, the whole object tree and embed it, we do cache it, to save some time, because you know, Kim from it's it's not a given that Kim from Claims Automation has changed the labels, but if they did, we just re-embed them and then we score them. We do an exhaustive search and suggest the five most likely categories or none of the above. And I swear, I swear to you, this worked great. We were like so impressed. We solved it. We were like high fives all around. And did we pop a champagne for this yet? We did not. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we got an evaluation data set where AirPods were severely overrepresented, right? Because people, uh, people just lose their AirPods all the time. Should I take a raise of hands? Uh, I mean, no, well, raise of hands if you lost your AirPods or similar. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you see, you get a bunch. Uh, do try to claim insurance for it. Remember. <laughs> uh, anyways, <laughs> anyways, uh, our system was uh, was shit at classifying AirPods, uh, and that was probably because uh, the or we think we found out that the uh, bird, the, the sentence bird model we were using had really bad representations for AirPods, uh, which is which is terrible. And so we just felt, okay, now we need to sit down and solve this problem in a rigorous manner. So we thought of a bunch of things which you might have tried too. What yeah. did we try? So first thing we tried was a, another embedding model. So our input or classifier is an embedding of the work. So we thought, okay, let's try a multilingual embedding model. Maybe it has a better presentation of uh, AirPods. It didn't work. Then we thought maybe we can, uh, you know, train several several classifiers, ensemble classification, and see if that helps. It didn't work. Then we nope. stacked the representations from different embeddings, put them into the same classifier. Yeah, like get more information. Like, that was a good idea. And it's like I wanted to explore that. It didn't work. Well, then we thought, how about we fine tune an embedding model, or maybe even better, train our own. Oh. 
okay. Oh, that's boring. I mean, we might, might as well use LLMs, right? Yeah. So we could also send our, uh, you know, strings and all the strings we have to an LLM and all the categories and maybe give us some, some prediction. Just, just give it to Marcus. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. But then, luckily, 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 someone, I, I think don't it remember. was Tor Helge. Tor, was you? Huh? Or, or Mia. Or Mia. Or, or I, I Sounds think it like was a Mia thing. So, so someone came up with a brilliant idea. Genius. That solved our problem, which is if AirPod in, lower, in text is lower, then the suggestion is headphone. And we're pretty sure about that, so we're going to give it one. And this was written, I think, a year ago, maybe, or so. Doesn't have an if else yet. It doesn't have an else. It sounds like this. Solved our problem. Solved our problem in a way where we, we were actually pushing to get this you know, through business. We want to implement this. We want to be done with it because we want to iterate over it later on. But that's a, that was actually a robust solution that uh, we were kind of proud of. <laughs> yeah, highly recommended. And I see now that we actually didn't time our uh, presentation very well, so we're actually done. So you have more time for uh, questions or lunch. Let's have a conversation. Yeah. Also, thank you for the presentation. And of course, does anybody have questions for Emanuele and Muhaf here? Uh, good. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you might know, we're already co-workers. So I'm sitting here watching this for maybe the third time. And I just now realized that there's actually one thing I wonder about. When you changed from default cross-entropy loss to focal loss in order to calibrate the model better for its predicted probabilities. Do you recall if the ordering of the probabilities changed at all, or did they stay the same? The ordering of the probabilities? Yeah, like say if the most probable example for having a positive sentiment on the one loss, uh, when you change it to focal, would uh, the most probable example change, or like yes, the fiftieth yes. mo most probable change? Yes, certainly. I mean, that's what why, why we did it, and it's. it's I mean, the, the whole thing started. They were laser focused on our F one and macro F one, and we didn't think about you know so uh, when thresholding the model at certain at certain score. Uh, but then, of course, that's the reason why we changed this uh, to to for, because we wanted the most typical example. So. If your model is overfitting in your training data, then you want the example that is as similar as to your training data to be on top. And we didn't want it to overfit on our training data, but we still want it to be sort of reflect how our training data was. So yeah, uh, the probabilities changed. So if I understand correctly, the goal of changing the loss wasn't just to uh, change the output number to be something that's more easily interpretable in terms of probability and confidence, but it actually changed the outcome of how you would maybe order the, those predictions. Yes. All right, thanks. I mean, you should have asked when we were together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh. Hello. Uh, did you actually implement that AirPod stuff or somebody else? Uh, uh, it was me, actually. Uh, because I'm <laughs> I'm just have a um, what's it called an experience. Um, I work for several customers, and the funny thing is that I've seen such solutions several times already in several customers, solving different problems. But and I'm always like, from an engineering point of view, I'm like, what the fuck? But it actually solves the problem. So I'm not the only one, and I'm not the only one. That's <laughs> yeah. good to know. Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, any more questions or discussion or suggestion? No one? All right. Okay. Uh, thank you once more. It was very interesting <laughs> and funny.